Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're going to get started in just a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're going to get started in just a minute. While we're waiting, if you want to say hello in the chat box, let us know where you're joining us from. Hello, welcome. If you're just joining us, we're going to get started in one minute. Right now, we're just saying hello in the chat box. If you're saying hello, make sure you're, you're changing that, that too to all panelists and attendees if you want everybody to see. All right, let's see who we have. We have North Carolina, Nevada, see Alabama, Washington, DC, North Carolina, Minnesota, everybody all over. You from Ohio. Awesome. Georgia, Oregon, Maryland. Hello, everyone. So I'll let you all continue to say hello in the chat box, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Your phone line is muted. This webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be shared afterwards. As we're going along, if you have any questions for our speakers, please put them into the Q&A box. We'll try to catch them if they're in the chat box, but it's a little bit easier for us to see your questions and ask and answer them live if you put them into the Q&A box. So with that, I will turn things over to Laura. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Laura Johnson, Vice President of Communications for the National Summer Learning Association. Happy back to school season as well, although it is still summer. Uh, welcome to our webinar, Good Nutrition Matters. Tips, quick meal tricks, and back to school strategies for learning success. We know that good nutrition always matters when it comes to keeping our children's bodies and minds strong. So today we are delighted to host this virtual event in partnership with Applegate Natural and Organic Meats. And if you've experienced their products, you know that Applegate offers clean, simple, tasty ingredients and their mission is rooted in holistic health. We also have some fun prizes for the first 25 attendees that registered and attended today. So you might be a lucky one uh, if you're on today. And also there's a grand prize for one lucky person, but we have 25 prizes to give out together, all together. So just to give you a quick overview of the conversation today, um, next slide. You're gonna hear a little bit about the National Summer Learning Association. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with our work, but we'll give you a quick little, quick little preview of um, what we do every day. You're gonna hear from our distinguished panel uh, and fun panel of um, distinguished guests. And we've got some fun surprises and a, a cooking demonstration with Applegate. And we'll have a Q&A and an opportunity for you to also engage in the conversation throughout, but also during our official Q&A section. And we've got some follow-up details to share with you uh, to close out. So a little bit about the National Summer Learning Association. Our vision uh, is very simple. Every child grows during the summer. Uh, we know that summers matter and coming off of a summer like no other, uh, this, is, this is a time that um, is really important for, for families, um, not just during COVID, but uh, historically throughout the year, summer has always been uh, a time that's very important. Uh, 
It's one of the most unequal times in America. And we feel that this is a time for um, supporting opportunities to address the achievement and opportunity gaps in our country. And so summer learning goes beyond our name. Uh, we want to see programs and communities addressing access to other resources like meals and youth employment. Uh, we also think that summer is a time for innovation and exploration. And so this summer, there have been a lot of lessons learned from the field that we're bringing into the school year. And so we think um, collectively as a field, this is a time to, to share um, lessons learned and reflections and best practices to support uh, the school year goals as well. We believe that this is a time for innovation for youth leaders and teachers, uh, whether it's an opportunity around professional development or trying out new teaching methods or exploring new partnerships. Next slide. So for more than 25 years, uh, NSLA has been uh, the only national nonprofit exclusively focused on summer as a way to close uh, opportunity and achievement gaps. And uh, the way we do this is uh, vary, but um, we disseminate what works in the summer space. Uh, we offer expertise and support for programs and communities, and we advocate for summer learning as a solution for equity and excellence in education. Um, our work is driven by the belief that all children and youth deserve high quality summer learning experiences that uh, truly help them grow and, and thrive, not only in, in school, but uh, in future careers and, and in life. With that, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome one of our new champions uh, in this space, a champion of children um, and just a champion for summer, the work that we do at NSLA. Um, I'm delighted to bring to the virtual stage, Kim Deliato. She is a mom herself, but also a journalist that writes about um, education and child well-being for the Sarasota Herald Tribune in Florida. And she's also the mom of a nine-year-old. So we're delighted to have her. And Kim is going to introduce our panelists. Kim, welcome. Thanks so much, Laura. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, so it's been um, a, great, uh, a great experiment this year has been um, challenging. I've learned that uh, working from home and homeschooling is, is not going to be for me. And, and I um, didn't realize how much we um, really relied on the school day to anchor a schedule. Um, so we're just off. Um, off on that. Everyone's a little mushier, everyone's a little more sedentary. Um, and of course, that's certainly happening on a large scale. Um, in fact, many experts have raised concerns that the absence of structured school days, recess, and access to school nutrition may negatively impact children's wellness overall. So, um, in fact, in a somewhat recent interview I did for a column I wrote at the paper, um, I interviewed Dr. William Dietz, whose research uh, revealed that besides age, uh, obesity was actually the um, other greatest risk for COVID fatality. Um, he also highlighted that time spent out of school, um, classically kids do, um, you know, commonly gain weight while out of school. So, um, and of course, with all the months spent out of school this year, um, you can imagine how much that's been compounded. But the good news is that by increasing access to fresh foods and a good diet, children can focus better, they can overcome health disparities and grow strong. So I'm really pleased to welcome a fantastic panel of experts today to power this discussion. Um, we also have a really fun cooking demonstration and a DIY project that you'll love. So here are our presenters. There's Kelsey Boone, um, Child Nutrition Policy Analyst with the Food Research Action Center. Hi, Kelsey. Hello. We also have Daniel Hatcher. 
He is the Director of Community Partnerships with the Alliance for a Healthier Generation. Hi, Dan. Hey, Kim. Great to be here. Thank you. Great to have you. Um, and also, we have Applegate's chef, Kate Winslow, co-author of Onions, Etc., and also of Coming Home to Sicily. Welcome, Kate. Thanks for having me. Thanks for, for being here. Um, so, Kelsey, um, can you take a moment to share some, um, a bit of an overview of FRAC and what's important about nutrition in this COVID-19 moment? Yes, uh, thank you, Kim. It's great to be with, your, with you here today um, and be a part of this important conversation. Um, like, like was mentioned, my name is Kelsey Boone and I'm with the Food Research and Action Center, FRAC, which is a national anti-hunger organization. We provide support around the child nutrition programs and a large focus of our work over the last five months has been tracking and providing technical assistance around the waivers and other program updates. We know that school meals are more important than ever as rates of food insecurity rise to record levels. We also appreciate all the work you're doing to meet the nutritional needs of children. Today, I'm going to talk about the importance of the child nutrition programs and how we can ensure children have continued access to the nutrition they provide. The child nutrition programs are proven to help combat food insecurity and ensure that children have what they need to be healthy and engaged in learning. Research shows that hunger and food insecurity can have detrimental impacts on children's health, behavior, and ability to learn. In fact, food insecurity is linked to the following, lower grades in math skills, behavioral and attention problems, more suspensions and tardiness, obesity, more frequent stomach aches, developmental risk, and difficulty getting along with other children. I also want to set the scene with some data on food insecurity and highlight the impact of COVID-19 on this issue. Data is a powerful tool for identifying pockets of need, underserved areas, and for developing city goals. Due to spikes in unemployment, in addition to other disruptions due to COVID-19, we know that hunger has increased in every community. New research from a variety of partners shows several trends. One, food insecurity, among children is rising. Feeding America issued a report that showed that 3.3 to 17 million people may become food insecure as a result of COVID-19. Compared to pre-COVID rates of food insecurity in one in seven for families with children, research by the Urban Institute shows that it is now one in five and that non-white families are impacted at much higher rates. Fortunately, the federal, federally funded programs are important resources for ensuring nutrition and remain in play now, whether schools are remote, in-person, or some combination of those. I won't go into this in too much detail, but I wanted to briefly cover the two buckets of programs that are federally funded to provide important nutrition to children. So the first one is school meals. Many may be familiar with these programs. Um, they include school breakfast and school lunch, which ensure that children get two healthy meals a day. Um, the second is out of, out of school time meals. Um, and these include the after school meal program and summer meal programs. Um, these are programs that take place when the school day ends, either after school or during the summer months. When schools are closed in the spring, many schools and programs actually shifted over to serving meals through the summer meals program. Combined, these ensure that children have access to healthy, nutritious meals all year long at school and during the summer and after school programs. All of these programs meet USDA meal pattern standards, meaning that the meals must um, serve a certain amount of grains, proteins, fruits, and vegetables. Um, another program that I wanted to spend some more time discussing is Pandemic EBT or PEBT. Pandemic Electronic Benefit Transfer or PEBT is a relatively new program that only became an option in the spring. It has become an important opportunity to provide nutritional resources to families who are losing access to free and reduced price meals as schools across the country close in response to COVID-19. 
PBT benefits averaged $5.70 a day for each school day that schools were closed this past school year. The benefit went to children who qualified for and received free or reduced price meals at schools that ran the National School Lunch Program. Some states issued benefits based on an application and some used direct certification um, from their school districts, so names from their school districts. Only a few st states still have applications open, though many states are um, still working to get their benefits out. Uh, currently, the PEBT program is slated to end on September 30th, and FRAC, along with our partners, has been working to push Congress to extend the program through December 2021 and loosen some of the restrictions that are um, in place around PEBT to allow it to adapt to the multiple educational models being used across the country. So despite the fact that the school day looks different, it is important that we keep these programs strong in reaching the families that need them. They can continue to operate even with schools being virtual. The USDA, who funds and administers the programs, has issued many flexibilities for program requirements so that schools can serve meals more easily. For example, instead of having to be consumed at school, many schools are setting up sites that send meals home or deliver them to homes. This helps to make sure that meals are being served safely in the midst of the pandemic. Additionally, students don't have to be present for parents to pick up the, the meals um, in most areas. So the USDA has also issued other waivers, including letting schools run the summer meals program, which is easier to run, and ensuring more children are eligible for, for free meals at this time. So uh, how to ensure access for children? Um, people can connect with school districts to determine how they will be providing meals, whatever way that um, may be, their pickup delivered at school. Um, they can connect with local program providers, such as the YMCA Boys and Girls Club, um, to see what nutrition services they're providing during this time. It's very important that we share information with other parents and stakeholders about changes to, to meal service and expanded options for access. Um, for more advocacy action alerts, you can visit frac.org, um, and you can also find updates for federal meals programs on that page. Kelsey, thank you so much for all that awesome information. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, now we're going to turn to Dan. Dan, can you tell us a little bit about the Alliance for a Healthier Generation? Sure, I'd be happy to. I'm so happy to be with you all today. Um, if you are familiar with the Alliance for Healthier Generation, put a yes in the chat box. I would love to know how many of you have some connection with Healthier Generation. Maybe you've been to a webinar we posted this summer. Excellent. Uh, love it. A few of you. Wonderful. Well, if you're not familiar, we're a national children's health nonprofit. We work across the country helping schools and community organizations get connected to good professional development to support the healthy eating needs of young people, physical activity, and, and social emotional health. So again, super happy to be with you all today. And um, I hope you enjoy the activities I have planned for us. If you've been uh, to one of Healthier Generations presentations this summer, we've done quite a few. We've been doing a lot of choose your own adventure type of activities. So I'm gonna do my presentation that style. So, would you rather start with a yoga animals activity or a DIY windowsill garden activity? Yoga animals or DIY windowsill? Give you a check chance to think about that. All right, I'm seeing yoga animals. One window sill. Thank you for using the chat box. I know I am uh, staying afloat by having chat boxes to connect with folks in presentations. All right, let's do yoga animals. So, you know, we're all shifting to this world of being on Zoom, being behind a camera, being on the computer so much. 
Um, I want to give you a simple activity that you can use with students, you could use with families, you could use with family members uh, as a way to add a little bit of movement to your day. So you could do it in between meetings, you could do it before you make a delicious snack, you could do it as a family after you eat your tasty snack. Um, and it's all based on this book called Yoga Animals. So hopefully you can, hopefully you can see that. And Yoga Animals uh, is a spin off of an activity, Wildlife Charades, that Healthier Generation, we've been playing a lot this summer. And you can find that on a nature bingo card that we created. So we're going to do Yoga Animals together. So I'm hoping that even though I can't see you, you're going to follow along with me. And we're just going to do two animals. So I'm going to read the first page of this book with you all. So get comfortable. Um, I wish I had a, a, a snack or a, a juice box to, to pass around as we had reading time. Um, but we'll, we'll dive right in. So this book is by Tara Stiles and Paige Towler. Healthier Generation works closely with Tara Stiles. We actually have a, a live yoga demo with her coming up pretty soon. So here's the, here's the first page of the book. Animals around the world jump and stretch and reach and curl. Join along and you can learn to move like them. It's your turn. So the first animal is a giraffe. So I hope you can see the giraffe. And it says, young giraffes reach to the tree, stretching tall her tasty leaves. So we're all going to reach like a giraffe. So take a big deep breath and you're going to stretch your arms over your head. You can bring your palms of your hands together. Keep your shoulders relaxed. Get a little bit more comfortable in your chair. And you can feel the top of your head reach toward the sky. So that is reaching like a giraffe from yoga animals. What do you think? So far so good? So we're going to do one more yoga pose together. Thank you, Ginkgo. Excellent. Eusebia, thank you. So this one I like. It says loud gorillas pound their chest, bend and hang their arms to rest. Bend like a gorilla. So I'm going to do this seated, but I'm going to read the standing instructions. So stand with your feet facing forward and slightly apart. Take a big deep breath in. Breathe in again. And when you're ready, breathe out and gently bend forward. So I'm doing this in a chair. So I'm bending forward from my hips. Keep your knees slightly bent if you're standing. And then you let your arms and your head hang toward the floor. So you can rest there for a second. So hopefully, as you're thinking about supporting whole child health and healthy eating and physical activity, uh, you can add a little bit of fun movement um, to your day. I really like yoga animals because I think there's a really some fun linkages to science learning, um, building curiosity about nature. But I think there's also a really great connection here to food. And the DIY project I have planned for us is this pint-sized window sill um, uh, garden. And, uh, you know, we were just stretching up like a giraffe. And you might know that giraffes are herbivores. Gorillas, I've learned, are omnivores. They actually like ants um, and termites as well. So some fun connections there. So we're going to shift over and do a windowsill garden that is fit for your pet giraffe. So we've got five minutes left. So this will be pretty quick. I'm going to share a link in the chat box. You can see the, an image that I put up on Twitter this morning. Uh, it's pretty, 
pretty simple to do and you'll get my email. So if you have any questions about nutrition education enrichment and organizing this activity, I'm happy to, to talk with you um, and share that as well. So who is ready to make a DIY windowsill? All right, awesome, Stacy. thank you. Sarita's ready, Maya's ready, Andrea's ready. Awesome, okay. So I'm gonna show you the finished product first because I think it's always nice to see kind of what you're working towards, especially if you're thinking about doing this activity with your kids. So I'm gonna move my screen back just a little. So someone give me a yes in the chat box if you can see what I'm holding up in front of me. Excellent, okay. Anybody wanna guess what plant is growing in my pint-sized garden? Liz, ex you got it, carrot. So now if we look at this, I don't think there's a carrot per se, but guess what it is? What part of the plant do you think is growing in my pint-sized garden? The answer is carrot tops. So I was making something way earlier in the spring and I was chopping off the tops of the carrots. So I put them, I put the tops of the carrots in my soil and I'm using an expandable soil because if you don't have a lot of space, it's a really great um, supply to have. It's pretty inexpensive. You just add about a third of soil in here, mix in some water and it will expand. So these were carrot tops at one point and now they're turning into carrot greens. So has anyone ever made anything with carrot greens before? Well, they're perfect for pesto. So we're gonna get a demo of a delicious sandwich in a minute. So if you're thinking about adding some more greens to your day, a pesto is a really simple um, item that, that you can create. And again, it's, it's pint size, it's pretty tiny. So you might have noticed that mine is relatively colorful. Anybody wanna guess what I wrapped the box in? Yep, you got it, Stacy. It's duct tape. Just so happens to be uh, tie-dye duct tape, which is, of course, all the rage right now. Um, you also notice I stuck some stickers on the side. So your kids can you be super creative with this. This is a fun weekend activity that you can do together. Of course, these, been, these have been growing all summer long. So it's definitely a fun project to teach patience and perseverance. So I have a larger one here. So I use a milk carton. The other one was a creamer carton. This is a milk carton. So again, I just cut off one side of it, wrapped it in my handy duct tape. And I'll show you the supplies I've got here. So this is the expandable soil. So you can do this pretty quick. So just put the expandable soil in the carton about a third of the way. Shake it down a bit. You can see it? Give me a yes in the chat box if you can see that okay. And then you add a little bit of water, which I'm doing carefully. And I like to use the back of the spoon. You just mix it up. So I used a bigger box because what I'm gonna plant and I'll post this up on Twitter if you want to follow along to see how well it does over the next few weeks. I've got some kale, um, kale seeds. So we'll see how the kale in the, the windowsill garden grow, uh, grows. I'll show you one that I did many months ago. I did not decorate this one, but you can see got some kale growing. The one on this side is gone because I actually used that in a recipe. And so that can sit on your windowsill. You could put it out on your front steps, whatever space you have handy, um, simple way to do, to upcycle. Um, you can avoid food waste. It gives you a nice project to, to work on throughout the summer. 
So I'll show you one more way. If you don't have a box, that's totally okay. You could use a cup or two cups. So um, I decorated this guy for Halloween. So it's basically two cups. The top cup has holes in it for drainage. It sits down in the other one. And um, you won't believe what this is. Anybody have a guess? Any guesses of what this plant is? It's a date. So it's a, a date palm from the grocery store. And all you have to do is put the date palm, the, tape, the date seed, the pit in a wet paper towel. So these have been in here for a month. So I'm almost out of time, but the last thing I'll do is I wanna show you, I'm unwrapping it. So if you're thinking about weekend learning, interesting STEM connections, the dates, do that pretty close. You can see the root is growing out of it. And in just a few weeks, it's gonna grow up and it has this really sturdy green palm um, leaf. So pretty excited. Um, to see where that goes. So I am out of time. I hope you like those two ideas. Again, I'll, we'll take questions um, uh, toward the end and just happy to be with you all today and hope you like this. And thank you so much. That was so much fun. I can't believe I ever threw away a carrot top. Love to that. Um, so next, let's go back to Kelsey. Kelsey, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Awesome, thank you, thank you. Um, so I have a question for you. Um, during this critical time for families, a lot of people have lost jobs, lost wages um, due to the shutdown, of course. Uh, we know food insecurity has increased exponentially um, and stricter lunch program eligibility could make it harder um, to ensure families get the, the nutrition they need. Um, so what can advocates do to make sure that families can put food on the table? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so, you know, as many know, SNAP is actually the largest benefit program um, for food assistance um, and one of the best ways to uh, address food insecurity. Um, currently, BRAC is pushing Congress to increase benefits by 15%. Um, so that would be all benefits by 15%, no matter the um, amount that you are receiving. Um, our other ask is to increase the minimum benefit. So um, those receiving the minimum benefit would be receiving more money in SNAP. So those are two uh, things to for advocates to uh, push for at the state. Another is actually the continuation of PEBT, which I mentioned before, uh, the pandemic EBT program. Um, we are currently in the process of trying to extend the program so that it lasts through this coming school year. Um, and in this way, it can help address uh, child food insecurity um, throughout this school year. And um, where can families turn to to get the support they need at the school level and in their communities to make sure um, students get the nutrition they need? Yeah, uh, so schools uh, should know where their uh, meal sites are and where there are meal sites in communities. So families should be turning to the schools um, and asking them where these places are where they can receive school meals. Um, they, uh, schools should also make sure that the meal sites are accessible to families um, and think through transportation barriers. Um, and uh, school districts could also be thinking about delivering meals um, so that all students remain, to, uh, remain in access of these school meals. Um, also the school waiver seamless summer flexibilities that uh, the USDA put out for the um, for the beginning of the at the beginning of the pandemic, um, those flexibilities are actually extended through December. So uh, schools have the option of staying on the seamless summer option, which uh, limit uh, gives them more flexibility um, whenever they are serving school meals. Thanks for that, Kelsey. 
Um, now we're going to turn to Dan Hatcher. Dan, uh, my question for you is with such a, an unusual school year um, and then the holidays are coming up, how do you think families can make the most of mealtimes together? Uh, thank you. Great question. Um, I would say find opportunities to bring fun um, to the table. Um, uh, Leslie put a link in the in the chat box for a new resource we've developed called Making the Most of Mealtimes. And one of the suggestions is to have handy um, conversation starters. So uh, fun things like if you had a superpower, uh, what, what would you want that to be? Or what's something you saw, you've seen in nature lately that um, you found interesting? So using those moments together to uh, stay asset-based and to check in, check in with kids um, and yourself. It's, it's, it's everyone wants to have a little bit of lighthearted conversation and fun in these uh, very uncertain, uncertain times. So we do have some resources on um, healthiergeneration.org. If you want questions, I'm sure your kids, you could come up with plenty of your own fun questions as well. Um, so conversation starters. That sounds really fun, Dan. Thanks. And how about, um, how about water? How can we encourage our children to drink more water and prioritize that hydration that's so important that I think a lot of us tend to forget about? Absolutely. Um, I would encourage folks to think about youth voice and creating opportunities for young people to invent their own infused water recipe. You could, you could do a, an assessment of what are, the, what are fruits and vegetables that you have in your refrigerator or in your house and then turn it into a game and say, okay, what would be an infused water that we could make? So it could be lemon, it could be lemon cucumber, um, it could be strawberry water. So just an opportunity to encourage healthy hydration uh, via, via youth voice and kind of like the windowsill activity and even the, the yoga animal uh, resource. These are opportunities to just foster curiosity and encourage kids to, to try new things. Um, I saw a resource put into the chat box here, um, an article we did with a partner on STEM activities for the picky eater. So if your kids are saying, I don't want water, um, uh, Try, give them the opportunity to try something new, but then connect it to something um, that they're learning um, and, and create a curious adventure out of it. Thanks for that, Dan. Um, now we're going to um, turn to Chef Kate Winslow. So get your plates ready, everyone. I'm so super delighted to welcome Applegate's chef and food stylist. Um, Kate Winslow is also the author of Onions Etc., um, Coming Home to Sicily, and is also the former editor at Gourmet Magazine. We're so happy to have you today, Kate. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, my husband and I, uh, we are contributors to Applegate. He's a photographer. I do recipe development and food styling. So a lot of the pictures of Applegate's foods come from us. We live in New Jersey. Um, we've been working with Applegate for probably the last seven or eight years now. And I'm really proud to work with them because of the work they do to um, create such a um, natural, healthy product. Um, when Applegate says their food is all natural, it means that it is uh, humanely raised, generally on a vegetarian or a 100% grass diet. Um, there are no antibiotics or hormones. Animals are allowed to grow at their natural rate. Um, there are no artificial ingredients or preservatives, no chemical nitrates or nitrites, um, no phosphates. And I, as a, as a uh, cook and as a parent, I really appreciate the transparency of their um, of their line or ingredients. Um, like I said, I am also a parent. And so like all of you, I'm dealing with this new school year that just started for us. Uh, we have a son who's 14. He's just starting high school. And um, in New Jersey, his school is doing a hybrid model. So 
He's in school two days a week and home studying, uh, working virtually three days a week. So at, in one way, we're really excited because we're getting a routine. I, I, I appreciated when Kim said that there's a, you know, there is a return to routine with school starting, even though it's not a normal routine. Um, but it's good to just have something to kind of hang on to and to have an earlier bedtime, earlier rise, and um, more structured meal times. That said, um, the days he's in school, there's no time for lunch because of a compressed schedule. The days he's home, um, he's in front of his computer all day, which means there can be lots of snacking. So it's been really important for us to make sure that we're um, stocking our pantry and our fridge with some really healthy fruits, vegetables, protein rich kind of things. So I wanna show you some of the things um, that you know we've been making Applegate put together a really great resource, which I think everyone has a PDF of, um, a coloring book uh, that they put together with some really fun, delicious ideas um, for some healthy snacks and lunches. And then there are also some activities for kids to do. So one of the recipes I'm going to demonstrate is um, these really colorful lunch kebabs. So I'm actually going to scoot my camera down to my work surface so you can see the ingredients. So we're going to shift things a little bit. There we go. Okay, and there's the recipe um, that you'll get in the PDF. So for this um, recipe, I'm working with uh, Applegate ham and Applegate turkey as our uh, protein components. We also have some cubes of cheese and then cucumbers, cherry tomatoes, and grapes. This is, the, this is one of those things that you can really um, work with what your kids like. Um, you can ask them, you know, what, what do they want? If they want chunks of apple, they don't like cucumber, but maybe they like bell pepper. Um, this is a place where you can get their, their input. You can also get their help. Little kids love putting things on sticks. So it's an easy way to get them involved in the kitchen with you. Um, older kids might roll their eyes at this, but they'll be happy when you give it to them. So is what I found at least. So I'm just um, cutting, I'm rolling, pieces of meat into, you know, rolls like that, cutting them into thirds and threading them on skewers like this. A little bit of cucumber, some cheese, a grape, and then you just kind of keep stacking. Um, so again, this would be a fun snack to have mid-afternoon, um, something a little different. It's just very playful. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't have the carbs that a sandwich would have. So it's just something different. And then a fun way to present it is on a wedge of watermelon. Um, so you can stick them right in there. And then you have your watermelon that you can eat afterwards. So I'm sure other people would have great ideas for what, um, here, I'm not sure if you can see that. There we go. Um, so a fun towering kind of snack. You could use shorter skewers um, or you can also, if you're working with very small kids, you might want to just snip the ends off the sharper part, but it's a fun way to get kids involved and make something very, very colorful. So I'm going to set this aside and if anyone has other ideas of what they might want to put on kebabs, I'd love to hear it. So just let me know in the chat. Um, so I'm going to move this over and make the next recipe in the uh, from the PDF of the coloring book. There we go. The Eat the Rainbow Sandwich. I'm going to move this over here. And again, this one's going to use um, turkey. And we've got our colorful food here. We've got tomatoes and shredded carrots yellow bell pepper. We have some hummus and some avocado. There we go. And we got our bread. Okay. So um, I like to use, uh, if your kids like it, to use a multigrain kind of bread. Um, if they prefer a white bread, just look for something that doesn't have high fructose corn syrup if you can, not too much added sugar, um, fewer ingredients. And so you can see these are the these are the ingredient the vegetables we're going to use. But again, you could you could really play with this. You could add 
slices of apple. You could add, um, if you really want to make it extra colorful, you could do a little slaw with red cabbage and get that purple in there um, or shredded beets. Now, it's unlikely that every kid is going to want to eat all of these things. And so this is another chance where you can talk to them and say, okay, what are the things you would really want to have in your sandwich? Um, you can model good behavior by making a sandwich that's fully loaded like this. And they see you eating that, you know, eating that they might be willing to try something new. You could make them just a turkey and avocado sandwich and put a couple of bell peppers and carrot sticks on the side so they can try that out. Um, if you don't like hummus or your kids are unfamiliar with it, you could try some butter or some mayonnaise. Um, and you could mix in some fresh herbs, um, a little bit of hot sauce if they like that. Um, uh, a little bit of pesto, you could put in some carrot top pesto and that would be really, really good. So we're just putting our veggies on like this. And then we've got some avocado and I'm just gonna smash this onto the other side. So we have hummus on one side. Whoops, we're losing our bell peppers. Hummus on one side and some avocado on the other. And I just like to cut this into chunks right there and then smash it on. So, and um, you know, you could toast this bread a little bit if you were making this ahead of time and packing it into a lunch. I often like to do that of toasting the bread just a bit because it will make the sandwich, the sandwich uh, hold up a little bit better. It won't get quite so soggy if it's, you know, in a lunchbox for a few hours. So, um, so that is that. I'm going to add that there and then close it up. Let's see, smash this a little bit more. It's almost like you're making a little bit of guacamole right on the bread. And then, there, that's a biggie. So that's our eat the rainbow sandwich. Um, and again, it's super adaptable. You could add all different kinds of other things in here. You can make it simpler. Um, you could put, um, you could pickle some of these vegetables a little bit so they have a little bit of tart and tanginess to it. You could add that carrot top pesto or a basil pesto. Um, it could be a lot of fun. So anyways. Those are the two recipes that we had for today. If anyone has any questions about those or other ideas that they would like to suggest for um, colorful recipes, that would be great. Um, I think kids really do um, eat with their eyes first. And so you wanna entice them with something colorful and fresh um, and that's gonna get them to wanna dig in. Great, thank you so much, Kate. Um, so now we have some time for some Q&A. If you have any questions for Kate or Kelsey or Daniel or any of our speakers, please feel free to add those to the Q&A box. So while we're waiting to see if anybody, if any of our audience has any questions, I think both Kate and Danny will touch on this a little bit, but any suggestions for maybe how to get children to try new veggies and new things? Um, whoops, am I, I'm, okay. Um, I really do feel like it helps to, like I said, to have them see you trying new things and that you're open to to try and things. Um, and I think, you know, with some vegetables having, if you're having kids try them raw, a little bit of a dipping sauce, like a hummus or a little bit of dressing, a ranch dressing or um, uh, some kind of mayonnaise that you've, you've mixed some fresh stuff into. I think that can just help for getting some of those flavors in, you know, 
having kids wanting to try them. Thank you. Danny, were you gonna add something? Yeah, um, one strategy we've heard from teachers and families is allowing kids to come up with fun names for things that are either relatively new to them or you know maybe it's an ingredient that like that you were putting into the kebab i really love that recipe uh, because it gives you an opportunity to try a variety of different things but if each of those ingredients had a fun name that uh, your children came up with um, mm -hmm. and then of course just repetition repetition trying things over and over again yeah i think i don't know what i can't remember what that um, statistic is of how many times a kid needs to try something before it really starts to stick. Um, but it is something, it's not gonna be the first time necessarily. It's gonna be, you just don't give up, just keep trying. Well, we had a question earlier, I think Dan, that you answered in the Q&A box about the windowsill garden and if students had to, needed to use duct tape around the milk carton or can it just be, or can it be done without it? One wonderful question. No, it does not need the um, duct tape. If the box you're using has like a coating to it, it will be durable enough. Um, of course, adding some tape or you could even put in some cardboard inside the box will give it a little bit more durability um, as well. But the tape isn't required. Great. Um, and I see in the chat box, a few people would love, love to hear about the, the carrot top recipe or the pesto. It's, it's pretty simple. I'm actually looking at Kate. I'm like, I bet you have a, a recipe in your back pocket for, for that. Um, when I made the pesto, I just I just blended the the carrot greens with um, nuts that I had on hand. I think I used ca just a few cashews and a little bit of olive oil. Smashed it all up. Um, you could add a little bit of cheese if you wanted to as well. Uh, it's one of those great kind of recipes that that you can choose your own adventure for that as well. Yeah, and I, we make a lot of pesto because you know, we have so much food that we're shooting all the time. And sometimes we have things that are almost kind of on their way out, like uh, arugula or baby spinach and, or you know, a head of parsley or cilantro. And I will turn all of that stuff into, we call it pesto, but it's just sort of a green sauce. So I just throw it in the blender, mixing them up or just one at a time with a little bit of garlic, the olive oil, some lemon juice, salt and pepper. And um, if I bake a lot, I'll stick it in the freezer and you can just pull it out in the middle of the winter and have something really fresh. But it's a great way to um, not waste those greens that are, you know, about to turn, but you want to, you, you want to keep them going. But so yeah, the carrot tops, um, you could do chard, you could do kale, you, I mean, any kind of green you can turn into a pesto, which is awesome. So I think if there aren't any other questions, I think we're going to wrap up. If um, Kate, Daniel, do, or, or any of our speakers, do you have any final thoughts or ideas, tips you want to share with our audience before we wrap up? You know, I'll, I'll just say that um, take good care of yourself. Um, it takes a lot of work to support kids if you're teaching or or parenting and teaching, um, or working in an out-of-school um, program. Um, so take good care of yourself, because it definitely takes a lot of work to, to do that. Um, and hope folks can think about these recipes and ideas as a way to practice your own self-care as well, um, and, and disconnect a little bit. And I mean, I would like to add on to, to that idea of self-care that I think you know, sometimes people get stressed out about making food and that it feels like just another thing you have to do during the day. But I think if we can reframe that a little bit and just remember that it's a time to be with your family, if you can make that time to sit down and have dinner, it can be a time to kind of reconnect, to slow down a little bit. And especially with all that's going on in the world right now, just to have that kind of peaceful time with the people that mean the most to you is really important. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I just want to say again, thank you so much to our presenters, uh, Kelsey and Daniel. A special, special thank you to Kim for moderating our discussion today um, and to Kate and Applegate for uh, sharing those recipes with us and um, 
uh, as we mentioned, as Laura mentioned at the beginning of the, of the webinar, we thank you again to, to Applegate for, for providing those, those swag bags that we're going to be sending out to our, our lucky winners. And thank you for everybody to attending today. Um, I hope that you got some great tips that you can use uh, with your kids or if you are a provider, if you can share with your, your the parents and the families in, in your uh, program. Um, and I'm just going to wrap up with a couple more announcements of things to come in the next couple weeks. Um, so this webinar is part of our uh, Voices of Summer webinar series. Uh, it's a, a series of webinars that we've been having throughout the summer and will continue to, to have throughout the year. Um, you can learn more about that on our website uh, at summerlearning.org forward slash webinars. There you can find links to past webinars that we've held on the arts, sports, uh, social emotional learning, all different kinds of topics. We have some coming up um, in on the next one coming up is on October 14th. We're going to be talking to some outward bound programs. Um, we're going to share how they were able to, to take a program which, which essentially needs to be outdoors and in, in person and how they're able to make it work this summer um, and maybe get some tips for how you could maintain your, your program during um, uh, these, this time. Uh, finally, if, if you are not following us on social media, that's the best way to keep up to date on new resources, new webinars, announcements. Um, so follow us on social media, uh, Twitter at Summer Learning or on Facebook at Summer Smarter Summers. Uh, you can also join, uh, sign up for our newsletter on our website and join special cohorts of peers who are interested in special topics like sports, literacy, youth or youth employment. Uh, you can also find out more about uh, NSLA's consultation support and technical assistance for your summer program. So once again, thank you uh, to everybody for joining us today. Thank you to our panelists, um, and we will talk to you soon. Bye, everyone. <laughs>